Well, thank you very much, and thanks to Lewis UK and the Northern Ireland Group for inviting me here today. And it's a real pleasure to, to get back here. It's always a good excuse to come home and uh, visit family as well. So thank you very much, and thank you all for turning out this afternoon. Hopefully, I can update you a little bit on some of the stuff we're doing, which might have future relevance to um, management of lupus. So, uh, as Aubrey says, I don't come from too far away, and I don't know if you know. We've been to the Lache. Does anyone know what the Lache is? <laughs> yeah, it's good, man. Um, so this is this is the Lache. This is the this is a nice picture of the, the village, and this is a statue that's set up in memory of Seamus Heaney, who is an even more um, famous and illustrious person from that village, um, Nobel Prize-winning poet, and uh, this is this is a, a statue commemorating uh, some of his poetry. So I grew up there. Um, and then moved up to Queen's University and spent a number of years here, both in university and then also training in rheumatology in Musgrave Park, where I did my uh, work with Aubrey. Um, and from there then I went to Toronto for a couple of years, and that was really to sort of develop an interest in lupus and expand that interest, because at that stage Toronto had one of the largest lupus clinics in the world. And I worked with a guy called Murray Urowitz there, and Daphne Gladman, um, a lady, um, who together we, we did some interesting stuff and was able to take that back. So I'm now in Manchester, so this is our hospital in Manchester, the Central Manchester University Hospitals Trust. Lovely hospital, built with PFI money. I'm not sure we can afford the mortgage, but it's a beautiful place to work and a really good teaching hospital. And then on, the, the, on your right is the old um, Manchester building, but I must say, I think the Lanyon building at Queen's is a much, much nicer building and much, much better set up. Of course, most of you don't, those are not the pictures that spring into your mind. When you think about Manchester, you probably think about red teams and blue teams. In fact, whenever I was going on the plane this morning, all the Man City fans from Northern Ireland were coming off the Flyby flight to head off to the, to the Etihad. Some of you might know that it's also it's a mecca for music. It's one of the music capitals of Britain. And this is a picture of the Smiths um, at the Salford Lads Club um, from the 80s. And then somebody else mentioned Coronation Street earlier today. And of course, that's also um, one of our claim to fame. Um, and you, know, you can come and visit that any time you wish. So I'm going to update you a little bit about some advances in lupus. And really what I'm going to try and do is to try and pull forward some of the stuff that Dr. Edwards talked about earlier on today and talk to you about two things. First of all, how, do you, how on earth do we start to get new treatments into the clinic and how do we make that jump from what's happening in science to into what's happening in the clinic and sort of what we're doing to try and expand the use of certain treatments in SLE. And I'll talk particularly about a register that we're running in the UK at the moment. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about room for improvement. Is there any room for improvement in the management of lupus? And if so, how are we going to try and improve that? So you saw a, another type of this slide a little while back about different targets for SLE. Does anybody know who the man in the top left-hand corner of this slide is? Dwight Eisenhower, that's right, and he was president of the United States in the late 1950s. And the reason that that's important was because up until 2010, he was, he was president when the last drug for lupus was licensed in the US. And then the next one was licensed in 2010. So about 60 years, there was a 50, 50 year gap in a drug being licensed for lupus in the US. And that drug was Belumamab or Benlista, which is mentioned as one of the drugs that's targeted um, in SLE. And this is just to say that that drug got through in Europe as well. So it's licensed, it's got a European license as well as an FDA license. And it was based on the notion that it is better than placebo, particularly in certain subsets of lupus patients. So this shows that when you look at people who were treated with belumumab, who had certain autoantibodies that were positive and low complement, about 50% of them responded to the drug, whereas people who didn't get belumumab but just got background treatment, only 33% of them responded without the belumumab. So that difference was significant enough that the European Licensing Authority said we can give this drug a license for lupus. 
But of course, the other drug that people have mentioned today is rituximab. Now, rituximab is another B cell depleting therapy, so it takes out the B cell population out of your circulation. And this is some work from a group in Sweden that showed that if you've got lupus in the kidney and then you track people over time with their kidney disease, the amount of protein that they're passing out of their kidney as a marker of response uh, improves quite significantly over a period of about nine months or so. So you'd say that's fantastic, that drug works, let's, let's get that into the clinic. The, the wrinkle was that there were two trials done um, with rituximab and lupus, one in people with kidney disease and one with people with general lupus. And essentially what you can see here is that if you take people who didn't get the rituximab and people who did get the rituximab, there's actually no difference in the two groups at 12 months. So the trial was what was said to be negative. There was no effect of rituximab over 12 months in this population. So that meant the company gave up on developing the drug in lupus and it put the kibosh on many people using it globally. So there are countries in the world where it's virtually impossible to get access to rituximab for lupus. And indeed, um, one of the problems then is if your trials are negative, you can't get a license. So therefore, if you're going to use this drug, it's on, not under a license. Now, that's, you think about licenses and you think about the, the piece of paper that allows you to drive your car, and this is, a, this is a, someone's driver's license here. Um, and the other thing you think about is James Bond has a license to kill. And that essentially means he's allowed, he's got permission to do it. So a license is saying that the, uh, the drug authorities in the country approve the use of this drug for a particular thing. Now, of course, if you think of all the drugs for lupus, there are three drugs actually licensed for lupus. Prednisolone, steroids, hydroxychloroquine, an antibalarial drug, and then atabrine or mepocrine was licensed by the FDA in the late 1950s. And then after a 50-year gap, the Lumimab got licensed for lupus. The drugs on this side are unlicensed for SLE. Now, that doesn't mean they don't work. That doesn't mean to say there's no trial that shows they're beneficial. So, for example, there's good trial evidence for cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate. But actually, what it tells you is that often drug companies make the decision that this is too small a market to actually be worth the candle of going for a license. So cyclophosphamide is a very old drug. The peak, that's generically made now. Nobody's going to go and get a license for that. Mycophenolate, they decided really not to pursue a license either. But a lot of these other things, we know they work, but they're so generically used now, because a company can't get a, a financial advantage in licensing it, they just don't bother. That causes problems because there are parts of the world where unlicensed medications are virtually only, you're virtually unable to use them. And in the UK, people sort of frown upon using drugs that are unlicensed, despite the fact that rheumatologists have had to use unlicensed drugs for years, because you just can't keep lupus patients on 40 milligrams of steroids for the rest of their life. So you have to do something. So you take that risk on yourself, if you like, to do that. But of course, we've been allowed to do that for many, many years. The, the problem then becomes if the unlicensed medication is also very expensive. Because azathioprine is a few pounds a month to prescribe that. Rituximab is 10,000 pounds a year. So then your authorities prick up their ears and take notice and say, right, well, you're not allowed to use that because it's unlicensed. Okay? So a lot of the difficulty, you'll hear people saying about licensed versus unlicensed medications, and one of the difficulties usually is when the unlicensed drug is expensive, then people begin to take notice. So I, I, I can write prescriptions, and this week wrote prescriptions for tacrolimus, mycophenolate, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide. Nobody rang me to say, that's an unlicensed medication, you can't use that. But if I write a script for rituximab, there's two pharmacists on my doorstep the next morning asking me what I'm trying to do. And so in England, what happened a few years ago under the austerity agenda was they said, right, no more rituximab for lupus because we don't think it works, the trials are negative, so nobody's going to be able to use it. So currently in England, and probably in Scotland as well to an extent, that you've got two biological agents we would like to use, but they cause problems from the authorities. 
The first one is belumumab or benlista. It's got a licensed fract of lupus. NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, for which we all have to sort of um, uh, have some kind of uh, accountability in, in England. Um, they haven't made a decision about belumumab yet. In fact, it's been going on and on and on for <coughs> about three years. They still can't decide whether they will allow use of this drug in lupus. And the Scottish Intercollegiate Group, or SIGN as they're known, um, have not approved this drug in Scotland either. Rituximab is off-label and it's not licensed. Very patchy use across the country. And so what we had to do to get this drug used in England, and that sort of rolls out to Wales and probably Scotland and Northern Ireland as well, is we had to write a policy to say, despite this drug not being licensed, we think it works in certain subsets, therefore we want to sort of put a guideline together to guide people as to when to choose these drugs. So we actually got to write the policy, and uh, I was sort of involved in that with a few other people, and uh, we basically said that it is reasonable to consider rituximab for lupus in people with what we call refractory disease, so difficult to treat lupus. And that means you have to have a diagnosis of lupus, that's probably stating the obvious, but you might be surprised um, how difficult that can be um, for some people to work out. Um, they have to have persistently active disease, and that means they have to have been failed to be controlled on two or more of the usual treatments, one of which has to be either MMF or cyclophosphamide, or the patient is maintained on unacceptably high doses of steroids, and we say 10 or more is unacceptably high long term. Um, and then we say this population should be offered a clinical trial, because we do have to improve the evidence for this condition. So we would offer people a clinical trial if it's appropriate, and then if not, we register them, and one of the other things is we register them in a national safety register. So we established this register partly to learn more about biologics and lupus, but also partly to try and improve access to these drugs across the UK. And really we're looking at the safety and long-term benefits of these treatments in patients with SLE. So what we've set up is what's called an observational cohort study. What that really means is we get people who are starting on a biological or starting on a drug that's similar in its intensity like an a, a, like a immunosuppressive <coughs> drug. And we follow people forward. And the doctor gives us some information about their lupus and how they're responding. And then the patient also sends us some diary information as to how they're getting on and what's happening to them. Both groups are followed long term. And it's different from a clinical trial. So in a clinical trial, the center who's doing the study basically flips a, does the computer equivalent of flipping a coin and says to the local guy, this is what to treat someone with. In an observational study, the doctor chooses what they're going to use, and we observe what happens thereafter. So essentially, you've got two groups followed up, and now we're able to follow people for more than five years after they've had their rituximab or biologic to see what's happening to them. So this gives us really, really valuable long-term information. The data by the clinic team is things like what type of lupus do they have, what's the characteristics of their lupus, um, what other medications are they on, what have they had in the past, what other illnesses do they have. So if you're looking for something like infection risk, if somebody already has got chronic chest disease or a big leg ulcer or an indwelling catheter, they're more at risk of getting infection anyway. So you kind of need to know that rather than attributing that to the drugs that they're being treated with. And then from the patient's side, we want to know about smoking, what work they're involved in, their, their drinking habits, etc., what they perceive their lupus to be like, and then things like what hospitalizations they've had, what appointments they're going to, etc. So you might think, well, why do we do that? So an illustration from yesterday was my research coordinator said to me, I've got this woman and she tells me that she's been investigated for a tumor in her kidney, and yet the center that she's being followed up for, for lupus, didn't report that when we asked them last month. And it turns out, particularly in England, you'll see that some centers are seeing patients from miles and miles and miles away. So in Manchester, the furthest patient I have is someone from Renfrewshire in Scotland, got a couple of people from down around Birmingham over in the world. If they get admitted for a pneumonia, they don't come to Manchester, they come to their local hospital. Now unless they tell me that or the doctor there 
writes me a letter. I don't know about that. So therefore, the patient diary helps us prompt for things that are going on. So how are we getting on? Well, we've got 35 centers so far that have contributed patients to this. And we have over 400 patients now registered across the UK. 380 of those have had a biological drug. And some of them have actually been retreated for a further time. So that gives us retreatment information. And 90 of them have had standard therapy. And you'll see on the top one here, the vast majority of these are rituximab. That drug that, first of all, NHS England said, no more use in England and Wales. Now we can continue to use it based on these guidelines. So this is some characteristics from the first 80 patients that we reported last year. So the majority are women. You wouldn't be surprised at that because lupus is predominantly a disease of women. Youngish age of onset, so more severe lupus tends to start slightly earlier. Um, disease duration about six years by the time they're getting on to their rituximab. One of the things that we find quite striking is the ethnicity. So uh, Dr. Edwards said earlier about severe lupus often being more common in people of Asian backgrounds, Chinese backgrounds, and of African and Caribbean backgrounds. And you'll see here that 60% of the English pop the UK population are not white. The white population in the UK is probably about 85%. So this is telling us a disproportionate number of severe patients in people from ethnic minorities. So last Tuesday, I had an emergency clinic where I saw three severe lupus cases, all of whom were primarily from Africa. And that's just the epidemiology of severe lupus. What kind of lupus do they have? Well, lots of them have bad skin disease, bad um, joints, and then severe kidney disease as well. So a lot of people with a broad spectrum of, of, of lupus that is affecting them. And then we looked at the response. So we said at six months, at three and six months, how many people are improving with rituximab? And you'll see on the improved slide here that it's just actually less than 50% have a response at six months that you can measure using an objective measure. So that's about half of them are getting better, half of them are not improving to a level that you would be really happy with. So that's really important to be able to measure that. From a safety point of view, there, uh, that we looked recently, and we're presenting this in, at an American meeting next month, um, the first 208 patients had 77 of them, a third of them had an infection after they had their rituximab. Um, and then about uh, 204 infections reported, most of them were within nine months of treatment, and 27 of these were serious infections that required them to be hospitalized. Okay. And actually, it turns out that the most common time for an infection or a severe infection is within about three months of the rituximab. Now, that doesn't mean it's the rituximab causing it. Because if you think about this, this is when your disease, your lupus, is most active. So it may well be that it's your active lupus that's causing this. It's also the time when you're more likely to be on higher doses of steroids. And steroids can trigger infection. But what we're saying to doctors, the message from this for doctors is, if you've got someone who needs rituximab, be careful and watch them very carefully for infection afterwards. Not because that drug is causing it, but because they seem to be at a higher risk over that period of time. And we'll be able to analyze that more in depth later on. So that's what we're doing with drugs and what we're trying to do with monitoring these uh, treatments in, in, the, in, the, in the community. So how are we doing treating lupus? Well, this will be, this is my history teacher wrote in beautiful copper plate writing on the left, my report for history. Could do better. In fact, he probably said he should definitely take up a career in science. Um, and of course, even Einstein had to do better from time to time as well. Um, so there is room for, there's huge room for improvement in managing lupus. So I'll give you a couple of facts. If you just take a cross-sectional cut of patients with lupus coming to any clinic. And here are four clinics in four different parts of the world, Canada, US, Italy, and Brazil. In all cases, on average, 
patients with lupus have measurable levels of disease activity. So they may feel better than they did six months ago, but they've still got residual disease activity on average. Sore joints, a bit of a rash, a few mouth ulcers. So their disease is grumbling along. And often we say, well, we're happy that it's fairly quiet. But the patient realizes that their disease hasn't completely gone away. Also, we can do better. So this is, this is one of the classic studies done in the last 10 years, comparing mycophenolate to cyclophosphamide in lupus in the kidney. And at six months, I'll draw your attention to the fact that these are the two best drugs for kidney lupus at the moment. And both of them had about a 50% response at six months, okay? So if I flip a coin, that's 50-50 which way it's gonna go. So when you go to see your doctor with, uh, what this is really saying is, when we give you a new drug for lupus, there's about a 50% likelihood that it's going to do well. And we can't predict whether you're in that 50% that will do well or the 50% that won't do well. We just don't know. In fact, one of our patients tells me that getting treatment for lupus is a very cruel lottery because you don't know which side you're going to come down on. Back to the Explorer trial, again, look at that, the response rate in the noticeable response rate in rituximab was about 35%. And this drug that got its license had a 50% response rate. Okay? So there's a common theme coming out here. Drugs that work for lupus work in about 40 to 50% of people in whom they're effective. And this is a drug that actually has just recently failed called epituzumab. But in their first set of trials, 45% of people responded. Okay. However, if you look very carefully, and this is work from a colleague of mine in Leeds, what they did was they took people who got rituximab and then followed them to see what happened to them. And they couldn't tell up front who was going to do well and who was going to do badly. But they followed some of their responders over time, and you can see there are people who relapse quite quickly after getting rituximab, and then there was people who relapsed much, much later, beyond about nine months. So the early relapsers and late relapsers. But that hints at the fact that not everybody behaves the same when you give them a new drug like rituximab. So that comes on to the idea of precision medicine. So precision medicine is now the big thing. Some people call it stratified medicine. In fact, the Uni Ulster University, Ulster University, not the University of Ulster, Ulster University have a stratified medicine institute. There's a huge push now to precision medicine. And this is the notion that if you have a population, so here's a population of people all going for treatment. The problem at the minute is we don't know which treatment is the right treatment for them. We can make our best guess, but we can't actually tell. Precision medicine essentially is to try and pull these people out and pull them apart and say, actually, if you had the right kind of measures, you could separate people out to those who are going to be NMF responders, those who are going to be cyclophosphamide responders, those who are going to be B-cell depletion responders. So there's a massive effort worldwide on precision medicine. So there's a precision medicine institute in Northern Ireland the Obama government has just put a shed load of money into this in the US. And the British government, through the Medical Research Council, decided about five years ago that they were going to invest heavily in precision medicine. So they started off by funding rheumatoid arthritis, they funded schizophrenia, they funded um, primary biliary cirrhosis and things like that. So we thought it would be good to get into this because we think lupus is a disease that's really ripe for this kind of thing. So about two years ago, I sent out an email to a few people and said, we've got to get one of these consortiums, as they're called, together. So we've got a big consortium put together of a number of academic groups across uh, the UK. So that's an adult rheumatology, pediatric rheumatology, um, different kinds of specialisms and academic interests. And we also pulled in, and we got buy-in from Lupus UK. So Lupus UK were very involved in supporting and sort of making very positive supports to this. And a large number of drug companies, because actually when you speak to drug companies, they're almost giving up on lupus. 
And we, we're saying to them, don't give up on lupus. We think we've got an idea that might work and might make your drugs work a bit better. So to illustrate that, in this year alone, there are two companies that have announced negative results from clinical trials that have had over 3,000 patients worldwide in them. Both four trials, negative. That's probably about $70 million worth of investment that they have to write off now because they can't take those drugs any further. So if you were that company, you might think, I'm not investing in lupus anymore. I'm going off into rheumatoid arthritis or something safer. We're saying, you've got to stay in lupus because this is now getting interesting. So the vision, we've got this consortium, it's called Master Plans. And uh, just to say, the, the most important thing is the Medical Research Council gave us £4.2 million pounds for this. This is probably the biggest single grant that's been given to lupus research in the UK. So the government are interested in this now. So the vision is to significantly improve clinical outcomes in lupus by focusing on studying people who have got into remission or low disease activity. And my hypothesis is, just like that prism slide I showed you, that lupus patients aren't all the same, that actually there are subsets who will do really, really well on some drugs and not on other drugs. So what we did was we said, let's go where the money is. Did you know Sutton's Law? Have you heard of Sutton's Law? Sutton was a bank robber in the US and he said, why do you keep robbing banks? And he says, because that's where the money is. You know, and uh, so you go where the money is. So we know that the B cell turnover seems in some way to influence response to rituximab and MMF. So we're going to focus a lot on B cells to try and understand what happens to them in people starting MMF, people starting rituximab. We also think that there may be other things like interferons that may actually be like a negative predictor. So we'll look at that as well. So the sort of the, the basic structure of this, it's called maximizing the, uh, maximizing the therapeutic impact um, with um, novel, um, novel systems. And that's where master plans come from. So the idea is there's a lot of information out there already. So a lot of companies have got data sitting in their warehouses, sitting in their computers, that they've almost stopped analyzing. And we've also got some big studies like the BILAG register that I've showed you, the SLIC group that we've talked about already. There's a lot of information in there. So we want to spend a bit of time pulling that all together to see if there's anything new that comes out of that that can help us stratify people. So that would be a quick win, if you like. The second place, then, is to take people who are going to start on these drugs again. So we're going to focus on MMF and rituximab to start with. So if a patient starts on MMF or rituximab, the plan is to enroll them into a study and follow them very, very carefully over about 6 to 12 months to see how they do on the drug. And then we're going to measure a whole lot of things, essentially. That's going to include how their B cells change over time, what's happening in their blood, what's happening in their urine, what's happening in their skin, if they've got a skin rash to start with. The whole idea then is that you can put this all together, and essentially the idea is you put this all together with different kinds of technology. Basically, you run it through very complicated computer programs, and what should come out the far end is that if you've got these three or four characteristics, you're more likely to respond to MMF than you would expect simply by turning up. Okay? So if you shift the dial from a 50% chance of response to a 70% chance of response, then that improves things. And then you have to test in another set of experiments that that actually works in another population. So this is a long-term um, plan. So Lupus UK have been really, really, really involved in this from the point of view of patient and public involvement. Patients are really central to this. In fact, one of the patients from Lupus UK, in fact, one of the Lupus UK office bearers came with us to the interview and basically stole the show and was probably swung it in our favour to get the money. Um, patients understand the importance of this kind of research because it's really your lottery that we're spinning every time we give you a new drug. Patients help improve the design of these studies. They help us with sort of reading um, information leaflets and saying that information leaflet, it might make sense to you, but it makes no sense to me. Um, and it helps us hopefully to improve recruitment and retention in these studies. 
So in summary, new treatments have been really, really painfully slow to develop for lupus. Some have evidence, however, to support their use, but in an age of austerity, it's very difficult to get high-cost drugs funded when you're competing against other high-cost drugs that clearly show benefit in another condition. But the British Isles Lupus Group Register has helped us study this, these drugs better, assess the real-world effectiveness of the drugs, and has actually politically helped support access to treatment and build the evidence base further. But there's still huge room for improvement in managing lupus. Most treatments have an approximately 40 to 50% response rate. So SLE is probably a disease with different subsets, and subsets may do very, very well to particular targeted therapies. So we need to develop more precise ways to identify patients early. And the tagline for our, um, our consortium is master plans. So we need a master plan. So your patients, so if you're a patient with lupus and you're starting any new drug, <coughs> MMF, azathioprine, rituximab, belumumab, ask your doctor, how can I join a study that will help us learn more? Because we need to learn more because we don't know enough about the drugs that we're treating to give you the best advice that we can. The BILAG register is open for, open for study and open for enrollment. The control arm of the BILAG register is open for enrollment and our new master plan study program is going to start early next year. So the Medical Research Council strikes back. Master it you will, try harder you must, as Yoda would say. And we do need to try harder to get these treatments out and be able to say to you with much more certainty, this is the drug for you and this is the one that will work best for you and be safest for you. We're a long way off that, but hopefully this investment in research money from Lupus UK, from, from MRC, etc., will help us get there um, sooner. Lots of people help me with this. The NHS fund our work, Arthritis Research UK, Lupus UK and the MRC, and lots of people from um, different groups. So thank you all very much for your attention.